Well, I'll give you greetings in Jesus' name this morning, and it's good to be here again. I'm very grateful for the opportunity, um, and I want to continue uh, my series on the economics of the kingdom of God. We're looking at the new covenant and doing that, uh, first of all, by looking at doing a survey of Luke's gospel and what Jesus has to say about economics in Luke's gospel. And if you remember uh, earlier when we talked about the old covenant, we looked at how God structured uh, the nation of Israel so that people would have the capital they needed to provide for themselves. It was based on the idea that each person would work and provide for his own family and that there were periodic uh, readjustments um, in, because inequities would arise because of various circumstances. There were uh, readjustments in the Jubilees and the Sabbaths and so on like that, the laws of gleaning. And of course, also the instruction to have an open hand to the poor. And then how God uh, brought judgment on Israel uh, in part because of its failure to follow that law, the, those commandments that had to do with how they were to structure their, their society, their economic life, and so on. Of course, that accompanied with that is idolatry and so on. But you know, I think when we think about that, uh, Paul does make a connection between idolatry and the pursuit of riches. We'll look at that later on when we look at what the apostles have to say about, about economics. Um, in the New Covenant, of course, the kingdom of God is not connected with a physical territory, but is drawn from people of every tribe, kindred, and nation who are gathered into communities, into colonies of heaven here on earth, and they are governed by a king who is Jesus Christ. And he is also, in a sense, our, he is actually our lawgiver who has given us commandments as to how we're supposed to work out the, what his kingdom means here on earth. And as we already saw, Jesus has quite a lot to say about how that works itself out in the whole realm of economics, what we do with our possessions, what we do with our wealth, how we're supposed to use it, and how we're, whether we're supposed to have it or not, and if so, how we're supposed to use it. And so I looked, first of all, uh, in Luke uh, 4 and 6 about the poor, uh, who God had a special, um, a special um, concern for, and uh, we talked about who are the poor, and I ended my last, um, my last uh, message with the thought that, you know, we can sometimes um, throw up a smoke screen, or we can kind of try to avoid what Jesus is saying here by, you know, uh, playing around with, well, you know, we're rich, everybody here in this country is rich, which is true in, the, in relation to the rest of most of the world and so on, and so what do we do with that? Well, that is a question we have to answer, what do we do with it? But so many times that kind of argument is used to diffuse the situation to kind of take the, in a sense, the strength out of what Jesus is saying by essentially saying, well, nobody's doing it, and so we shouldn't be so insistent upon this. You know, if we did that with the rest of what Jesus said, we would be right where the rest of professing Christianity is in our world today. We would be going to war and killing people. We would, we would, be, um, we would have divorce and remarriage. We would have sexual immorality and so on. One of the things that struck me recently, uh, I was reading in Christianity Today, there was an article and it was about evangelical pastors who are so, so concerned and so disturbed that their young people see absolutely no problem cohabitating without marriage. And they do it. And it's no big deal to them. All right? It's no big deal. And, that, and the, the thing I would have to say is, is that they're actually living out a, a theological belief. That, and they're actually doing, in a sense, the kind of things that a lot of other people do when we look at the whole thing of economics. Does, does that really, is that really something we have to do? And so my, 
my question, my, um, my word today and throughout the whole thing is we really do, and I really do appreciate what Brother Marvin shared this morning about the pattern that Christ sets for us and that he expects obedience. And of course, that was the thrust also um, in our Sunday school lesson, you know, depart from iniquity. Obey the commandments of Jesus. And so what we're looking at today are the commandments of Jesus, and we need to take them seriously. And we need to figure out how to work them out. And my, my plea to us all and is that we may not have figured out how to work them out perfectly here. And there may be inconsistencies. In fact, I know that there are some inconsistencies in how we work this thing out. But if we do not have the basic understanding that Jesus means something here and we have to figure out how to work it out and how to apply it, we're going to be in a very bad situation. We're going to be disobedient. All right? All right. So um, this morning, I want to look at, continue looking at what Jesus says in the Gospel of, of Luke about about um, the economics of the kingdom of God. The second point I want to make, the first point I made was about God's special regard for the poor. The second point I want to make is that Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of, of riches. In the parable of the sower, he talks about in Luke 8, verse 14. Now the ones in describing uh, who are the ones that, who fell among the thorns. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Okay, he talks about, Jesus talks about how riches can deceive us. And why do they deceive us? Or why do they deceive us? Well, you know, we become attached to them. <clears throat> they provide us the kind of life that we feel comfortable, that we find pleasure. He talks here about the pleasures of life. And so we focus on that. And when something begins to kind of push in on that or say, you know, you need to uh, give up those pleasures of life. And if you think about it, you know, what is... What is, the rule, what is the root of a lot of immorality? Is it, not the, is it not seeking for pleasure, for gratification, oftentimes for instant gratification, but also sometimes for long-term gratification? And we, we tell ourselves if we just have this or we just are experience this and we just gratify this desire, you know, it'll, it'll give us this sense of satisfaction. Well, the fact of the reality is that it doesn't. Because it's, it's kind of a, like an open pit or an open mall that just kind of you know, eats, uh, is never, never satisfied. But Jesus talks about those who've heard the word of God, okay, and they responded to it. They responded positively to it, all right? But they had cares, they had focuses here on this earth, they pursued riches and they pursued the pleasures of life, and what happens? It gets choked out. Whatever inclination, whatever desire they had to pursue after God gets choked out. We heard about this morning, John shared about a person who, you know, who seemed to have a desire some time, not so long ago, but now he's, he's uh, fallen by the wayside. He's, as John said, he's walked out into darkness. And it is a matter of light, and it is a matter of darkness. Okay, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Jesus, if you remember, the third point I want to make is that Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 11, verse 3, is uh, the Luke's form of the, of the Lord's Prayer. He taught us, give us this day our daily bread. That's what we're supposed to pray for. Give us this day our daily bread. And God is concerned that we have our daily bread. God is concerned that we have our, our needs, uh, our physical needs taken care of. He is very concerned about that. And he also wants us to be dependent upon him for that. And the fact of the matter is, I was just talking to, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that oftentimes, whatever our efforts are to uh, pile up something, to take care of for the future, 
Um, they sometimes turn out to be very futile. I was, there's an older gentleman who walks past my house every day, he lives just down a couple blocks away. He takes this house, and he had to move from one place to another a couple years ago. Why? Because all the money, and it was a pretty good jag of money that he had saved up, was running out. And he had to downsize and find cheaper place to live, and so on, because his money was... was, was um, is running out. And my, my wife's parents did a similar kind of thing. And you know, toward the end of their life, they had no more money. They absolutely had no more money. And they had spent their lives being very frugal, being very saving, and so on, piling up investments and so on like that. And toward the end of their life, they didn't have enough money. Most people can't do, the one of the things that's interesting in our society today is a lot of this is, is, a, is a chasing after futility, okay? Because most people can't pile up enough to take care of themselves toward the end. Um, but we can pray, we can pray, deliver, I mean, give us this day our daily bread and trust that God will provide our daily bread, okay? And I'd just like to say here in relationship to this, um, and I think this is, a, this is an attitude that we have here, and I think it's a good attitude, and I think it's an attitude that needs to, to be, <coughs> needs to be uh, continued to be cultivated, and that is the idea of retirement. I think as long as God gives any of us health and ability, we should work. We should continue to work. We should continue to work to provide for ourselves. And we should continue to work to provide and help those around us. You know, retirement is an interesting kind of idea. You know, you get to be 65 and you retire and you kind of live this life of leisure. That's kind of the American dream. Okay? You buy a Winnebago and you go traveling and so on. That's sort of the American dream. Well, I think that God wants us to continue to work and continue to provide for ourselves as long as he gives us health. And then when, when our health begins to fail, oftentimes we have to cut back, but let's continue to do as much as we can, to work as much as we can, as long as God gives us help, and then trust him for what the future holds. Now, <clears throat> the fourth point I want to make is beware of covetousness. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke 12, chapter, 13, uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 34. And I want to look at this in two sections. The first section I want to look at is uh, verses 13 to 21. All right? And I want to, I'll read this. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, notice here, Jesus warns against covetousness. Now, what is covetousness? Well, dictionary says it's an eagerness for gain. It's a desiring more. It's wanting a greater share. That's covetousness, okay? And you know that one of the commandments in, in the Old Covenant was, thou shalt not covet, all right? And it's interesting. We'll look probably at that a little bit more closely when we look at what the apostles have to say. But you know what Paul, when he zeroes in on the sin that, <coughs> that um, uh, in, in Romans the sin that he has to deal. He talks about, I didn't know what it was until the law told me what covetousness was, instructed me in it. 
Uh, so he focuses on, on covetousness. Now, you, you might think he talk, would talk about lust, and he does talk about lust. But covetousness is a form of lust. It's not a sexual lust, but it's a lust for things. It's a lust for possessions. And it's ultimately a lust for security, or maybe I should say a lust for, for a false security. The idea that if we just pile up more and more and more and more, we can, like this G person that Jesus talks about in this story, build a bigger barn, put it in, and put the stuff in, sit back, and enjoy it. And Jesus says, you know, you're a fool if that's your, if that's your purpose. Okay? Because you could die tomorrow, and then what would happen? Okay, what would happen? And I, I think about that. I'm, I was just thinking about that recently. Um, and in, more, in recent years, I have, been, I have thought a lot more about death and dying and my own mortality than I did 10 years ago. Part of it is, is I have all these things I want to get done. There's a few books I'd like to write yet, and I don't know if I'll ever get them done. I'll probably research until you know, the nth degree and get it all together and I'll die. That's what I think is probably going to happen. I think about that. I think about that. That's, that's, a, that's a sobering thought. We go pursue all this stuff and so on, and then you know what? You could die. I, I think about that, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't mean this in any bad way. I just, I just I thought about that with Brother Lynn. You know, he built that addition for his family and then he died. I always just thought it was so sad. He had this idea that he was going to have some, he had this nice, it was going to have a nice little shop so later on he could do some woodworking and do some things like that. And then he died and he never got to do it. And that's so sad. But that is what life is like. I'm not saying he shouldn't have built a shop. It was probably, you know, down the road. He, if he lived, he would have done that. It would have been a fine thing to do. But life is uncertain. Life is so uncertain. Okay? We just heard a while ago about a woman, I mean, she was younger than I, but we knew people, we knew her, knew her husband, grew up in this community. She had an aneurysm and she died in her mid-50s, okay? Death is very unpredictable. You go down, I, I work with a woman who has been a widow for about 30 years. Her husband was killed in an automobile accident. She raised her children by herself. She never expected that. Death is a reality, okay? And so Jesus, Jesus tells us here that to bank on doing all, piling up all this stuff in the anticipation that you're going to be able to sit back on your hunkers and eat, drink, and be merry. It's a, he says you're a fool if you do that. That's not what your focus is supposed to be. All right? He says, beware of covetousness. Um, and he says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, what does it mean to be rich toward God? What does it mean to be rich toward God? There is, <clears throat> there is a treasure that we are to accumulate. There is a pile we are to pile up. There is a richness there is a richness that we are to, to uh, gather and have, and that is the richness toward God. This points to the fact that the pursuit of our life has to be focused on God and what his will is and what his kingdom is about. That's what we're supposed to be focused on. That's to be the pursuit of our life. Whatever we're doing, wherever our work is, in which we, and we spend, you know, we spend a good part of our lives working to provide for our physical needs. And that's right and that's proper. But in our work to provide for our physical needs, we have to realize that we are simply doing this. We're, we're doing this because it's all part and parcel of our pursuit for God's kingdom. Okay? And I just think about the opportunities that we have, particularly in our work, particularly for us men in our work, Many of us have the opportunity to do what? Meet people, encounter people, okay? And 
there are people out there who I really truly believe, and we've encountered them, who have a hunger, who have a desire, who have a sense that they're lacking something. And in going about our, our daily work and so on and, and the mundane things, we need to be open to, we need to be aware of, we need to seek out those opportunities to speak into people's lives and to share it with them in whatever way we can the good news of Jesus. I was talking with Zach Morgan this, uh, yesterday, he was sharing about a contact that he had with a young man at Pagan Fagan, I mean not Pagan Fagan, at, um, at um, um, McCune's Lumber and so on. Wendell was sharing a, a while ago, we need to keep our eyes open for those opportunities and maybe even sometimes make them. Okay? Let's, in, the, in our mundane, everyday work as we're trying to provide for our families, look for those opportunities to live out the kingdom of God and to share it. And you know, they'll know us by the They'll know who we are by, first of all, our honesty, our generosity, our giving good value for our work, making sure that they know that we are people who, who uh, give them what is, in a sense, a good deal, that we're never people who are, who are shysters or who, who shave it our way or who are tight or whatever. And if people get that, you know, and, and I would have to say that sadly, among some of our people, I'm not saying here, but among some of our people, largely speaking, there is not always a good reputation that way. And that's a shame. That's a real shame because th that discredits Christ. And you know the fact of the matter because we are uh, peculiar looking people in the eyes of the world. Um, they will identify us with, with those who are not giving a good testimony. So it's so very, very important for us to give a good testimony. And, you know, there are just many opportunities in which we can do that. And I just want to encourage you to, to think about that. Let's then look at <clears throat> verses 22 to 34. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouses nor barn, and God feeds them. Or how much more value are you than the birds, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his statue? If you then are able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toll nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little flay faith. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. Okay? Who's he talking about to here? He says, those who worry, those who have an anxious mind, those of little faith, and those of a doubtful mind. Those are the, those are the people who are addressing. And so the, the seat, the, 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 the foundation of people accumulating piles of riches, I think Jesus would say here, is based on anxiety and anxiousness and worry about the future. It's a lack of faith and trust in God. And it's a doubtful mind. It wonders, is God really going to take care of me? Like he said. And you know, that is really the original sin. That is really the original sin. Because you remember what the serpent said to Eve. Will you truly die if you eat of this? Okay. Are you sure God really will do that. You know, maybe God's trying to hold something back from you here that really would be good for you to enjoy and participate in. And he created in her mind this doubt that God actually had her, had good intentions for her, that he was, in a sense, holding something back, some good thing back from her. 
And she believed that lie. She ate the fruit, and it caused a great calamity that we are living with today. Well, what are we to do instead? Okay? We're not supposed to worry. Okay? Uh, what are we supposed to do instead? He says, seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <coughs> we are to seek God's kingdom first. And then we are to trust that God will will provide for us okay he will provide for us he'll he'll give us the food we need he'll <clears throat> give us the clothing we need he'll give us the house that we need to live in those are all kind of basic things that we do need and god recognizes them okay <clears throat> he ends by saying for where your treasure is there your heart will be also most people today would wish Jesus would flip that and say, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. That's what people really, that's when they look at this, is what they actually say. They flip it around, and they want to say, and this is a whole, this, this is a whole way of looking at things that is just endemic among professing Christians. When they talk about the heart, somehow they disconnect it from the life that's lived. And they want to deny the fact that what you see, okay, what you see is not what the heart is. Well, it is true that people, there are people who can be hypocrites and hide some things, and they can fool people for some time, some time for maybe a while, okay? Um, the, uh, Jesus talks about, he talks about wolves and sheepskins, in which wolves uh, are covered over with sheepskins, and you might think they're a sheep, but if you look closely, you could probably see the wolfishness sticking out of them. He never talks about sheep and wolves' skins. He never talks about that. There's, if you see somebody, if you see somebody that's a wolf, okay, he's a wolf. Inside, he's a wolf. Okay, you can have sheep, you can have wolves and sheepskins, but you do not have wolves. Okay, you now have wolves who are inwardly sheep. Uh, I mean, um, <clears throat> so what Jesus is saying here is that where you pile up your treasures, okay, that's where your heart is. It's not that you're not supposed to pile up riches. It's not that you're not supposed to pile up treasures. It's where you have them piled up. All right, that's important. And do you have them piled up here on earth or do you have them piled up in heaven? All right. Um, and I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that the things that we do for God, in a sense, is a, is a power. I was just reading in um, Clement's letter to the Corinthians. It's one of the early church writings in which he talks about this. And he talks about how um, people's generosity and so on is, is accumulating a pow up in heaven. People's faithfulness to God is accumulating a pile up in heaven, and that's where you want to have it, okay? What are we supposed to do with our, our riches? Well, we take care of our needs, and then we distribute what's left over to those who have need. That's how we pile it up in heaven. And, you know, if you think about it, that's really what Jesus did for us. Out of his riches, okay, he made them, they made, uh, he provided for our salvation, Okay, so we're to seek the ki kingdom of God. He says, give alms, give alms, and provide treasure in heaven. Now, my son and I, my oldest son and I have this uh, discussion. He lives in D.C., and um, he has come to the conclusion that when he's walking down the street, and there are many different people who, uh, he, there, are, there are homeless people, there are people out begging and so on. He doesn't give them anything. He said, I'm not going to do it and so on. And, um, and he has his rationale. You know, he gives, he gives to other things and, you know, he, and so on. It's not that he's not an ungenerous person, but he's not going to do that. Well, I may have shared this story before with you, but I, when I was 19 years old, I was in England at a study abroad semester. And I went to church that morning, and this is a large church, and I came out of the church, and there are all these 
beggars there. And this one man came up to me, this middle-aged man, he was kind of scruffy looking, and he said to me, can you give me, can you give me a bob? I, I think it was, a, no, it was like 50p or a pound or something like that. And I said, no, and I just sort of, you know, motioned him away and so on. And I don't know what happened, well, how I, if what I responded to him was so unusual or whatever, but he followed after me and he cursed me. He cursed me. It was so, such an awful experience. But you know what? I felt cursed. I felt like I deserved the cursing because I had not done what Jesus had told me to do. Now, I had all rationales. You know, you can talk about, you know, he probably would have went and spent it on drink, okay? He probably would have, you know, he looked sort of scruffy like that. He probably could have, and I, you know, and so on. But, you know, I, I thought to myself, I didn't do what Jesus told me to do. I didn't do it. And I felt the curses that he rained down on my head, I deserved. Now, you don't have to agree with me about that one, but that is truly how I felt. And I was convicted that if I was asked, if somebody came up to me and asked me for something, I would give them something. I didn't have to give them everything they asked. I may not have to give them, um, may not have to give them what they ask. Maybe I could give them something else. But I would not just turn them away empty-handed. And I have been in cities and other places where people come and ask me for something. And I give them some. I make sure that I have, I have some dollars, I have some change, and so on. And you know what they do? They say, God bless you. And so instead of being cursed, I become blessed. All right? Now, they may not do with it what they're supposed to. I had a friend, we, when we lived in Philadelphia, there was this one man who lived on the same street, um, and um, he was a drunk, and he spent all his money on drink and so on. He came to one of my friends and asked him uh, for some help. He needed some money to buy food and stuff like that. Well, my friend knew that he would spend it on drink and so on. And so he said, I'll take you to the grocery store. He went, took him to the grocery store. He bought a couple bags of groceries, gave it to the man and so on. You know what he did? He went down to the corner bar and exchanged those bag of groceries for drink. He did. You can't stop people from doing with whatever you give them. You have, really have no control over it. You can only hope that if you help them, they then might use it for what God intends it to and what you intended to. But in the end, you have really absolutely no control over it once you give it to them. But you know what? If God was parsimonious with us, you think about it. Who did Jesus die for? He died for the whole world. He shed his blood for the whole world. Does the whole world respond positively to that? No, it doesn't. Most of the world does not. Does that mean that Jesus wouldn't have, have died for them? Well, of course he died for them. Does that mean that they have done with what he gave them, this great gift, what he gave them, they have done with it? No, he hasn't, they haven't done that. All right? In fact, Jesus tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. God gives good things, even to those who are evil. He showers his benevolence, his, his kindness, and his love and mercy upon them. And Paul tells us that while we were yet God's enemies, Jesus died for us. Not for a good person did he die, but for those of us who are evil. And it's only through such prolific, profligate spending of himself that any of us can be saved. All right? So what I'm saying to us here is that let's trust that if we do what God tells us to do, yes, people may not respond the way they should to that. But you know, some might. Some will. And we will have done what Jesus tells us to do. All right?
have an open heart, an open hand, you know, and, and think of ways in which you can demonstrate to people your love and your kindness. I think about that when we go to the room, you know, what we're giving. So far, we've seen very, very, very little fruit for that. Okay? We've seen very, very little response to it. But I think we continue to do what we are doing. Why? Because if anyone who comes there is going to respond to the gospel, it's only going to be because we were there and we're doing what we're doing. Okay? And we may spend a lot of effort, a lot of time, and so on doing it. And there may not be that much return, but it's the only means by which anybody will come. Anybody will have a chance. And you just think about what Jesus did, how much he spent, and how little small return he has gotten for his investment in the sense of people who are responding to him. But yet, he was willing to pay that great price. Now, using your money for the kingdom, Luke 16, verses 1 through 8. Starting at verse 1 of Luke chapter 16. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your swordship, for you can no longer be a steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said, to the first, how much do you owe me? And oh, my master, and he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? So he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you, fa- when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also much. Therefore, you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon who will commit your, to you your trust, the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in what another man is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. Now this might be a puzzling parable for you. All right? And the reason why it might be puzzling is because you want it to do too much. All right? One of the temptations with parables, and it's a little bit like the whole thing where it talked about the household, vessels of honor, dishonor. You, you have to make sure you're not trying to make a metaphor, analogy, do too much work. All right? <clears throat> there may only be one connection that's being made here. Okay? Jesus is certainly not saying that you should cheat. If you're working for somebody, you should cheat your boss. He's not saying that. We know he's not saying that, okay? But that's what this guy did. He cheated his boss. Why? He cheated his boss because he knew he was in trouble, and so he cheated him. He had been cheating him, but now he cheated him even further so as to buy friends for himself so that when he was out on, out, kicked out of the house of his, of his employer or of his master, he had some place to go, all right? He showed a remarkable sense of self-preservation, didn't he? All right? Uh, And Jesus said, this guy is wise like a serpent. He's wise like a serpent. All right? He figured out what he needed to do to take care of himself. All right? So it isn't that Jesus is saying, you should, if you work for somebody, you should cheat them. That's not what he's saying. Okay, he's saying, show some wisdom here. Just show some sense. All right? All right? Use your unrighteous mammon. Okay? Use your unrighteous mammon to buy friends for yourself. Okay? And that's not so, that's not so much that we're doing it 
it's that we're doing it for our self-selves, for our selfish reasons, okay? But everything that we give to help someone out who is in need, we are using unrighteous mammon to buy friends for our, ourselves, and more importantly, we are, buying un, we are using unrighteous mammon to buy friends for the kingdom of God, to create receptivity on the part of people to the message of the kingdom of God. You all get the CAM newsletters, don't you? What's the constant theme? People are helped out with food, with clothing, with firewood, with whatever it is. And what do they do? They're grateful. And they're grateful for the people who have been helping them. They're grateful to us in sort of an indirect way. And by doing that, we have bought friends for the kingdom of God. People who, because they have experienced the generosity of Christians, are open, become open to the gospel, to the Christian message. Now, it's not an exact correlation, and some people can walk away from that, and they can just, oh, just kind of be thankful and, and never consider it. But it opens doors. It can open doors. It can create a, a receptivity. And that's what we should be focusing on. How can we create this receptivity to the good news of the kingdom of God? Well, it's by demonstrating the generosity of Jesus Christ through the generosity of his people. All right? So use it in that way. Use it to build up the kingdom, kingdom of God. And you know, the other thing I think about, though, is that it has to not be focused on us and for our own self. Uh, remember, Jesus uh, talked about, about uh, people who like to do their alms before men and they get the recognition and so on like that. And he said they have their reward. That's not what we're doing. Okay, that's not what we're doing. The alms that we are given, and I think it's a, a very good practice in many cases to make sure that alms giving is done in secret, to make sure that if you're sharing with somebody, you do it in secret and so on. It doesn't always have to be that way, but I think it often is the case <clears throat> that the focus has to be that this is coming this is coming from God himself. This is coming from Jesus. This is coming because of what Jesus has been doing on this earth through his people. That, that has to be the focus. All right? And that way, by that way, we, um, we um, buy friends for ourselves. We buy friends for the kingdom. And then Jesus goes on to say, you cannot serve two masters. You will be loyal to one and despise the other. Um, you cannot love God and mammon. And he's very clear and very emphatic about that. All right. John D. Rockefeller was, a, in his day, a multimillionaire, which means more than then in the 19th century than it does today. But somebody asked him one time, how much money do you want? And he said, just a little bit more. He just wanted more, some more. He just wanted more. He had more money he could ever spend, but he just wanted some more. Okay, He served mammon, even though he was a deacon in the Baptist church. Okay, He served mammon. That was his focus. It wasn't the kingdom of God. All right, I want to finish up by looking at the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, 18 to 30. Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Now a certain man, ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I've kept from my youth. So when he heard these things, so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. There we get into the treasure of heaven again. How does he get it? He sells all that he has and gives it to the poor and he's going to have treasure in heaven. All right? In case you're wondering what Jesus meant when he said treasure in heaven. All right? 
But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, see, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wives or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many more times more in this present time and the age to come eternal life. Notice the question here. Good master, the rich young ruler asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus didn't say nothing, just believe, on, just believe uh, or anything like that. Just have faith. Faith alone will do it. He didn't say that. He said, well, what's the commandments say? And he quoted, and, and uh, um, you know, the commandments, and he quoted them. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear falseness, honor your father and your mother. Those are all dealing with how we relate to, to other people. But there's one missing. What's the one Jesus didn't bring out? Don't covet. Because if he was said, don't covet, the young man could not have said what he said after, in response to Jesus, which was, I kept all these since my lo- all my life. And he probably did. I think he was a good little boy. Probably somebody we'd all be proud to have as a son. Fine, upstanding young man. All right? But Jesus said, you lack something. What is it you lack? You're covetous. All right? You're covetous. You have it. You, ha- you, you, you have this rich lifestyle. And it's, it's made possible because of this accumulation. It may not have even been something he accumulated. It may have been something his parents accumulated or his grandparents accumulated. Okay, it may have been inherited wealth. And that uh, brings up a very interesting question. What do we do with inheritances? What do we do with them? All right, I'm not going to answer that this morning. But it's a question we need to think about. Okay? Well, you know, today, being good Christians, we wouldn't say, well, I've kept all the commandments. Uh, a professing Christian would say, well, I'm washed in the blood. And that is certainly important to be washed in the blood. Okay? But it's Jesus saying to us, you still lack one thing, so all that you have. Give the poor and come follow me. Being washed in the blood. Dealing with the root of our sin. And remember, Paul talks about covetousness is right there at the root. Okay. The whole purpose of being washed in the blood is to prepare us to be vessels of honor who have put away iniquity and who are following Jesus. Okay. Being washed in the blood is not just to get us into heaven, okay? But it's to prepare us to follow after Jesus. Now, this young man heard this, and what did he want? He wanted eternal life. What must I... He sensed that there's something else that he had to do. Otherwise, he would have felt very, very comfortable with his performance thus far. But he sensed there was something he still was lacking. And Jesus told him what the thing was that was lacking. Did he want eternal life? No, he did not. In the end, he did not want eternal life. Because he was not willing to do the thing that Jesus told him he had to do to have eternal life. Which was to sell everything he had, give it to the poor and come follow me. What did he do? He turned his back on Jesus and he walked away. And you know, Jesus looked at him and he was sad. He was sad for this young man. And I think about how many people Jesus is sad about who have come to him and say, yes, Lord, I want, to, I want eternal life. I want, to, I want to be yours. What do I have to do? And Jesus tells them what they have to do. And they say, that's too much. I can't do that. I want to hold on to these other things. And they turn away and they walk away. And Jesus' attitude to those persons are the same as he was to this young man. He's sad. It saddens him. It grieves him. 
because this young man has turned his back on the very thing that he says he wants. And it is the thing in some sense he really wants because in us there is this thing that God has placed in us that wants that. The question is, are we willing to give up what God says we have to give up to have it? And this young man walked away and said no. And Jesus says, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's harder than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, I've heard, if you read commentaries, which are interesting, they tell you this story about how in Jerusalem there's this city gate that's just a little small little thing. It's really low, and for a camel to get through it, they have to unburden the camel, and they have to get it hung down on its hunkers, and it just kind of worships its way through. The only problem is that that wall was not built until, I don't know, what, the 10th century or something. It wasn't even around then. Somebody in the 19th century, some, some Arab tour guy told some gullible European Christian that that's what it was, and they, they went back home and wrote about it, and every commentator since then has picked up on it. That's, what I, that's my supposition. Okay? That's what I think happened, because that's how things like that happen. A lot of things happen like that in the 19th century. It's, it's all part of parcel of George Washington cutting down the cherry tree. It's that kind of mythology. All right, we all know he didn't do that, right? Now, I think Jesus was, in a sense, using a metaphor here, but using it fairly, fairly almost literally, okay? It would be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a sewing needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that is a hard proposition, that's a fairly insurmountable um, obstacle because camels don't go through the eyes of a needle. They don't go through the eyes of a needle. It just doesn't work. But what did Jesus say? It is, but, and, and so the, 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 his disciples said, well, well, then who can get in? Well, why would they have said that? Well, they were Jews. And you know, it really helps if you're a rich person, to observe the law, all the, particularly all the dietary rules and all the things then that the, the, the Mishnah and the Talmud and, and then the traditions the elders have piled up on top of that as to how you're supposed to work those things out. It really works better if you have the financial means to do it. A poor person finds it would have found it a lot harder. And so these guys are saying, well, if this rich guy can't do it, if he can't do everything that, you know, the law, all the law says, how are we going to do it? We don't have the means by which to do it. Well, that tells us that the kingdom of God is not made for rich people. That's not how you get in. Okay? What's the scripture say? Come without money and buy. Okay? Without money and buy. It's not, uh, the kingdom of God is not, is not something it's not something that we get into by buying our way into it or by accumulating it as I think the Jews would have seen it. In fact, they, they would have seen that this young man as being blessed by God. That's how they understood God's blessing. And Jesus is saying, no, he's turning this whole thing up, their whole way of thinking on its head. And they said, well, and okay, their response was, well, we have left all and followed you. And they did. They left their nets and they followed Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me. And what did these disciples do? He's surrounded by a group of persons who have who's, done exactly what he talked about. What he's asking this rich young ruler to do. And you know what? There was somebody just after this incident in Luke's gospel who responded the way that Jesus expected this rich young ruler respond. You know who he was? Zacchaeus. This man also had a pile. Now, probably unlike the rich young ruler, he probably didn't accumulate that pile in a very honest uh, way. But he nonetheless had a pile. And when Jesus encountered him, Zacchaeus' response was, Lord, 
If I have defrauded anybody, I will pay them back four times, which is what the law prescribed. If you stole something from somebody, you paid it back four times. And then he said, I will give half my goods to feed to the poor. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that after he paid everybody back four times and then gave half his goods to feed the poor, he didn't have much left over. But you know, he encountered Jesus. And Jesus... That encounter with Jesus changed how he thought about his possessions, how he thought about his destiny. And what did Jesus say about this, this uh, about Zacchaeus? Today salvation has come to this house. For this man is too a child of Abraham. There we see the positive response. Okay? Then in closing... One of the things I think people will say, and I've heard people say this, interesting. Well, doesn't God need the money of the rich? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Okay? Luke 21, 1 to 4 says, And he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. And he said, I truly say to you, to you that this poor widow has put in more than all for all of these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God but she out of her poverty put in all her and all the livelihood that she had I think that God can multiply the gifts of the poor and I'm not so sure that he can do so much with the gifts of the rich it certainly doesn't benefit them they're not willing to give up all and come follow Jesus. Well, in closing, I just want to say that <clears throat> I don't have all the answers. I don't have this all figured out exactly in every situation how it's supposed to be worked out. I have some ideas about how it's supposed to be worked out. And I think as a congregation, we've had some ideas over the years about how it should be worked out. And as I mentioned before, there are probably there are inconsistencies in that. I think we probably could be doing a lot better. So we could. I think we could examine our lives. We could examine our possessions. We could ask ourselves, do we really need these, these particular things or not? Um, and so on. But if we accept what Jesus says here as the bottom line, and we need to come to terms with it, and we need not, we, can, we should not explain it away. We should not defang, in a sense, what Jesus is saying here. We should treat it like we treat the rest of what Jesus tells us. When he tells us not to retaliate with violence when violence is done against us. When he tells us to be faithful to our spouses for our whole life through. When he tells us not to lust. When he tells us about all the various different things that he commands us to do. The genius of our tradition is that we have taken seriously the commandments of Jesus where other professing Christians have not. Now that's no credit to us. It's a gift actually if you think about it. And it's a gift that we should share and it's a gift we should not be ashamed of. If you think of it in that way. That what we have been given is the understanding that we take seriously the teachings of Jesus and we cannot explain them away, we cannot put them aside. That is a gift that has been given to us that not everybody has. And it's a gift that we need to accept with gratitude and thanksgiving. But it's a gift that we need to perpetuate. And it's a gift that we need to pass on. And it's a gift that we need to work out in more increasing ways in our own lives, in our own experiences. And so what I'm just simply saying here is what Jesus says about the economics of the kingdom of God is, is a gift to us. And we have to figure out how to do what he says. And that's what I challenge myself. That's what I challenge you. Let's not explain away what Jesus said. Let's figure out how to do it. All right. Is there any response to the message?